Good evening and welcome to Money Matters. My name is Kim Manhattan and I'm a business attorney in Radnor, Pennsylvania. I focus my practice in the areas of life sciences, healthcare, and information technology. Tonight we're continuing our special series on life sciences and innovation leaders in the Delaware Valley. Before we get started, I want to remind our viewers that from time to time, financial issues relating to life sciences, healthcare, or technology matters or companies may be discussed on the show. These discussions are not and should not be viewed as financial advice. Moreover, since the program is pre-recorded and shown at a later date, please keep in mind that the information may no longer be current. You should always check with your financial advisor before entering into any financial transaction. I'm happy to have with me this evening uh, as my co-host, Charlie Huntington. Uh, Charlie is a co-founder and board member of BioStrategy Partners, a tax-exempt organization that helps life sciences entrepreneurs with their pre-seed companies. Charlie, thanks for being here. Pleasure, Kimmon. Um, I've got a question for you. Okay. Can you give us a summary, give our viewers a summary, please, of what happened within the venture capital world around Philadelphia with some of the industries you just mentioned, life science, biotech, pharma, technology sure. last year? Sure. I, I don't typically track the amount of investment as, as, a, as a general rule. I don't track it day to day, month to month. Um, frequently, there are a number of uh, companies locally that support the legal industry that do a lot of reporting on, for example, uh, the number of deals and the, and the names of the deals that happen on a quarterly basis. Okay. Uh, so frequently venture capital deals, private equity deals, those things are reported quarterly by a number of different com companies locally. And I always keep track of the deals that are happening. But after the end of the year, there are reports that come out that tend to focus on the, the amount of activity like venture capital activity, for example, on a national basis and what's happening in different metropolitan areas. Um, and this is the perfect time because right after the end of the year you start to see those reports. And I read an article the other day in the Business Journal <coughs> that was really a summary of a PricewaterhouseCoopers report that comes out annually that talks about the volume of venture capital activity nationally and then, and then by metropolitan area. Um, according to that report, Philadelphia did about $420 million in venture capital deals last year. Now that's, you know, barely up over the year before. I think in 2012 was about $415 million, so we're only talking a $5 million difference, um, you know, year to year. Um, on a, now, relative to, on a percentage basis, the state of Pennsylvania and Philadelphia gets by far the lion's share of the, of the venture capital deals in PA. PA did about 6% of the overall deals that were done around the country. Um, and, but in, in absolute dollars of, v, of venture capital funds invested, only about 1.5% you know, of the dollars that were invested nationwide were invested in the Philadelphia region. Mm -hmm. um, uh, right now, Philadelphia, that $420 million represents about half of the VC investment that, you know, that w occurred back in 2008. You know, it was over 800 million back then. So that's, that's a little bit disappointing. And when you, when you look at the, at, the, uh, at the number, the numbers nationwide are up about 7% for VC investment, but only about 1% in the Philadelphia region. So we're a little bit behind, you know. Where Sounds the, like we have a ways to go. We have a ways to go. Um, and we're not right now in the top 10 um, metropolitan areas in terms of venture capital investment. Now you and I talked to people a lot on, on the show over the last two and a half years. Uh, we talk a lot about the difficulty in getting venture capital investment in life sciences. And when you think about how life sciences and healthcare is such an important, there are important industries here locally. And we have the infrastructure for, we have the pharmaceutical companies, the universities, the talent. I wonder, even though this was, this is just me speculating without having you know detail in the in the uh, report but i wonder whether the fact that venture capital firms are not as enamored with the life sciences industry as they used to be because of the long time from you know the, the idea until the ultimate commercialization and the regulatory overlay and that it's a lot easier maybe to invest in an IT company 
where they can invest their money and get it out you know, three years later. I wonder whether they're backing out of the life sciences space a little bit and redeploying that, those funds elsewhere has affected the numbers in the Philadelphia region. I mean, I, as I said, there was nothing specifically in, the, in that article to say that, but I speculate that that's a possibility. I bet you're correct. Yeah, at least in part. But, you know, I'll keep an eye on it, and obviously if, uh, you know, if I get more information around that, I'll report it in a future show. That's great. Um, before we uh, introduce our guests, I do want to remind our viewers that if you have a question for Charlie and me to answer in a future show, please feel free to send that question to Money Matters TV, 205 East Levering Mill Road in Valley Kinwood, Pennsylvania, or alternatively, email that question to moneymatterstv at gmail.com. It's now with great pleasure that I introduce our special guest for this evening, Steve Nappy. Steve is Temple University's Associate Vice Provost of Technology Commercialization and Business Development. He has more than 12 years of experience in the technology transfer business. Prior to joining Temple, he advanced through all levels of technology transfer at Florida Atlantic University, including first as being a licensing associate and then an assistant director, and ultimately he was the interim assistant vice president for research and director of technology transfer. Since joining Temple in 2008, Steve's leadership of Temple's commercialization enterprise has resulted in significant growth, including an increase in revenues from $340,000 in 2008 to $11.5 million in 2013, a doubling of inventions, the formation of 13 new companies in the past three years, the creation of a startup incubator, and the launching of a technology proof of concept funding program. Steve holds a bachelor's in business administration in management and marketing from Florida Atlantic University, and he's done MBA coursework in finance. He also serves on the board of directors of BioStrategy Partners and is a member of the Association of University Technology Managers and the Licensing Executives Society. Steve, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Our pleasure. It's our pleasure. Can you tell us how you first got involved with, with business development and technology commercialization at the university level? So it, it certainly wasn't a, a <coughs> conventional path into the tech transfer business. Um, I was a business student at Florida Atlantic University, and um, I was urged by my family, my brother, and others to, to go for an internship uh, before you get out of business school. And it just so happened that the uh, university was starting a technology transfer office. So uh, I was fortunate to land the internship there. Um, not really understanding exactly the, the business of technology transfer, uh, but we started from, from scratch. Uh, the, the person that started that office was a veteran tech transfer director um, who uh, was able to lift the office from boxes of inventions that we had to pour through. Uh, and, and really, uh, we had to build as a team uh, the systems uh, of technology transfer from scratch. That's the ad disclosure process for faculty members to, to follow, to submit their ideas, the protection process through patents, uh, the licensing process, how we interact with companies, um, and the business development and the tech funding process as well. So it gave me a great launching point uh, for uh, what we were able to do at Temple. How, if at all, did your, did your business background and training prepare you for what you did, I mean, it sounds like building it from scratch at, at Florida Atlantic and also, you know, what you're doing uh, at Temple and, and have done over the past five years. Sure. And I view uh, my role as focused on forming a business strategy around the innovation. So uh, the best place for uh, someone like me to add value is making sure that we can help um, you know, I have the pleasure of working with some of the brightest people in the world, our faculty members. Um, when it comes to realizing and getting an innovation to patients that may be in need or, or the marketplace in general, that requires uh, you know, assessing the business strategy to move that forward um, and executing on that strategy. And that's an individual plan for a specific technology, but more so the overall office has to be uh, run similar to a business. Uh, you're looking at 
Um, you have customers at the university. You have products that you have to develop. Um, and you have industry partners that you have to work with to move those products to market. Um, and we need to do that in the most effective way uh, for our, our inventors and our primary customers. Since you've been at Temple, what would you say is the most challenging aspect of your duties there? So initially it was creating a, a system that people believe in. Um, so this, is, this cuts across any um, area of the university, administration, faculty, staff. Um, you hear a lot of stories about tech transfer, you hear about some of the successes, uh, but you need to create um, a system that also delivers results for people to believe in it and participate in it. Uh, people get engaged through success stories uh, most of the time and um, that's what ultimately makes them a believer in the system. Uh, so initially it was, was building that confidence throughout the system that the tech transfer office can work, uh, can work for you, it can partner with you to realize your innovation as something that can uh, help people in the end. Um, and to build that confidence, it comes down to make sure that you deliver on your promises. So uh, one of the initial challenges happened to be building that level of confidence uh, at the university. Um, when I was uh, introducing you at first, I, I ticked off about four or five really impressive accomplishments since you've been at Temple. And I was wondering, uh, of all those achievements, which is the one that you're most proud of? So a lot of people will focus right in on the primary numbers of revenue uh, disclosure numbers. So uh, while as a university, uh, the faculty uh, and even the community should be proud of uh, Temple, Temple's ability to achieve those numbers and those results based on um, its research enterprise. Uh, I'm most proud of achievements where we can uh, accelerate the development of new technologies that can pump out and improve those numbers. So my individual role is making sure that looking at the tech transfer system it, uh, in, uh, as a system and then tweaking the, the components that are necessary to advance that system and optimize that system. So setting up space for companies to locate once they're created out of the university. Um, helping to create a path for faculty members to prove their concept uh, and attract industry partners to the table or polishing the technology. Um, and, and creating uh, mechanisms for us to work with entrepreneur and industry more efficiently. Um, those, are, those, those are achievements that, that I focus on and, and at least we can control. There, there are an awful lot of universities in this region and, and statewide, you know, a, a ton of universities, some of which are bigger than Temple, some of which get more, you know, uh, research dollars from the government or, or third party uh, uh, payers. Um, but um, ca if, you, if you can, in terms of, let's say, both absolute dollars and mm -hmm. maybe as a percentage of the, of the research dollars that the university gets, mm -hmm. tell me where Temple stands relative to other universities in the state. Sure. Um, so we look at the Association of University Technology Managers, they run an annual survey that looks at uh, the metrics for tech transfer offices. Um, based on that data, Temple ranks for universities 29th uh, in the country, uh, just behind Harvard. Uh, in the state, we're looking at a number two ranking, uh, just behind the University of Pennsylvania. Um, now you pointed out the relationship between research expenditures. Uh, we have uh, about $140 million worth of research expenditures uh, per year uh, at Temple. So if you compare the research expenditures with the commercialization revenue that's coming in, um, Temple is uh, number one in the state uh, for that return on um, research, invest, uh, research expenditures. Uh, nationally, it brings us to about a number 17 ranking. Okay. So Temple has established a leadership position in innovation uh, and commercialization um, uh, based on its ability to translate inventions uh, into products and revenue. That's impressive. 
Steve, I'm wondering if you can describe for our viewers how your office, namely the Office of Technology Transfer as well as Business Development, mm. uh, how would you, how, how do you interact with the entrepreneurial faculty and the, and the staff at right. Temple? So, uh, key to the interaction is, is making sure that we're a partner in what they're doing. Uh, they are experts in their field. Uh, they have their own businesses to run as well. They have people that, that, that they have to keep on, on salaries. Uh, they have to fundraise. They're going out and raising grant money. So they're, they're almost their own entrepreneurs within the university. Um, we have to make sure that our process is working alongside what they're uh, working on from a research perspective. So uh, what we've uh, really implemented is an embedded approach uh, for from a staffing perspective so we have one of our technology commercialization managers these are PhD level managers uh, based in one of our major research centers so we're right there on site to assist with faculty uh, questions with their new ideas and then we bring them through a process in which we look at which ideas to pursue uh, we receive over 60 new di discoveries per year um, we s pursue 30 to 40 percent of those so we have a process which we go through that looks at the uh, intellectual property landscape. It looks at the commercial landscape. Uh, once we're done with that and it's uh, a go from there, we will uh, uh, go ahead and secure intellectual property protection. Uh, and then it's our, our focus to go ahead and get that technology uh, into the right vehicle that can move it to market um, and to help us get there. You mentioned the Technology Development Fund. Uh, that's a new initiative that's going to add a lot of value to that process. This is not one of our pre-scripted questions, but I, when, when you think about someone who might be employed, faculty employed at a university, and we can back Temple out of this and just talk generically, professors are sometimes asked, most of the time I think at a research-based institution asked to do research mm -hmm. as well as teach. Right. Do you think we'll ever get to the point, or are we at the point with some universities now where they're being forced into entrepreneurialism or, or not? So, so uh, that's a great question, and I think for a while we were training faculty to be entrepreneurs. Um, what we, the approach that we've taken is uh, the, the most powerful model is allowing faculty to continue to lead in their field and continue to innovate. And if you put faculty in the position of running their business mm -hmm. while they're trying to do that and run their own business of uh, keeping their lab alive, uh, something's going to suffer. So our approach has been um, well, they can be entrepreneurial, certainly, uh, as far as leading a company. We want somebody at the leadership position driving that company that's had experience doing so. Um, that presents a challenge, right? right. We, tell, we tell faculty that um, that's the structure we prefer, but then we have to find somebody to, to actually drive that vehicle. So uh, that's one of the challenges we're, we're addressing and uh, one of the areas that through our networks and through other programs that we're establishing, uh, we will be uh, facilitating. So can you describe which departments uh, would most often use your services within tech transfer? It's, it's, a, it's a great question. The, uh, when I first started in 2008, you had um, a few departments that were generating most of the activity. That may have been chemistry, for example, um, and departments in the School of Medicine. As we've expanded over the past five years, uh, our services and our resources that are available to faculty uh, to commercialize their ideas, we've, we've had gr uh, broader participation from departments across the university. So if, if we look at our data, um, it's no longer driven by uh, a f select few. Uh, mm -hmm. Now we have a very diverse pipeline of intellectual property coming into the office that extends through the law school. Um, you, in, school of Business, Engineering, Pharmacy is, is coming online strong. Um, uh, dentistry, the School of Dentistry was one of the schools that was able to get the first product to market out of Temple. It was a dental device. Wow. Uh, 
Um, so we're seeing that that diverse pipeline of intellectual property right now, and it's it's really exciting. So when you look at those uh, departments within the university, which bring which bring you technology or, or develop technology, can you put your your finger and on any characteristics that might help them in terms of getting to commercialization more so than other departments maybe? I, I can tell you that we've had examples of uh, misunderstandings that um, maybe will discourage a department from engaging in the process. So, uh, for example, um, publication is key to disseminate research findings. Um, in some cases, there, and this is our challenge of building better awareness and training programs, um, in some cases, uh, faculty may think that it's one or the other. It's either you publish or patent. Um, so there's, when we inform and build awareness that, listen, it's, it's as long as you file your patent application before you publish your research, you can enjoy both. And to support the commercialization of your idea, we have to have that intellectual property protection. So for those departments that uh, we've worked closely with on establishing um, that awareness about the process, um, become repeat um, customers back into the office. And it's something that over the past three years, we've started to join f department level meetings uh, to make sure that our process is understood, yeah. and and it's it's clearly our responsibility to get that communication out. And the better we can do that, the the more we're going to see engagement even increase across the university. So, the businesses which have been successfully launched or in the process of being successfully launched, how do you find that the uh, the academics who have gotten you know, the, the professors and the scientists who've right. gotten it that far, are they staying engaged and how do you keep them engaged? Uh, I think absolutely the answer is um, you know, the faculty member that develops the invention has such a high level of passion for seeing that get to benefit the public. So they do stay engaged and we want them to be engaged throughout the process. You can't have a, a deal that's executed by the tech transfer office that you then flip on the switch to a, a company to go ahead to pursue it and bring it to market without the faculty involved. Um, and they willingly are, participate in that process. So in a startup company situation, uh, it keeps the uh, business closer. Uh, so that engagement increases. Uh, versus a, a large company uh, may bring it more in-house in the company versus uh, relying on the faculty member. Uh, so startups do increase that engagement um, uh, and, and certainly is one uh, area of the university where we continue to increase in activity. I remember, I mean, you bring up an interesting point, and that point is, um, you know, most scientists are going to be in love with whatever they're studying, right, and whatever right. they're trying to develop. And we at BioStrategy Partners right. have happened upon some entrepreneurs mm -hmm. where we say, you know what, you're focused on the, the garnish on the plate, not the meat and potatoes. Right. And you're leaving something at the doorstep of big pharma, mm -hmm. which could be very profitable, but that's not their passion. Right. So I know exactly what you're what you're talking about. Hopefully, the passion and the profit motives line up, but not always. So. And and the biostrategy partners example is, uh, you know, and this is why it's important that uh, we have the opportunity to, to serve on that board. Um, that the pharma program that is run by biostrategy partners puts our faculty, our researchers, in the same room with the pharma. Uh, researchers, mm -hmm. and I have to tell you the the experience uh, and and the opportunity to watch that interaction is just amazing, and exciting, um, and, and it, it it breaks down that barrier that we've we've often had, which is uh, you know what what are the industry expectations for a particular in innovation? All right, so if it's a strict funding arrangement to, between the university and pharma, mm -hmm. are there 
is there the ability to mentor that project to a, a commercially attractive stage. So BioStrategy Partners has been able to put uh, stand up a program that allows that close interaction throughout the project so that when we get to um, a decision point, we can, we can make a decision that would be of most interest to uh, our partner in that case uh, to invest in further uh, research and development. And BioStrategy Partners is a group that's gone across different universities and different companies and, you know, I would think that uh, it's, I would think that, let's face it, it's tough to hear difficult news, but if it's brought by an independent source like a BioStrategy, I think that softens a blow. So. And, and we talked a, a little bit about engagement with resource, uh, uh, researchers, um, and, and you do have to give difficult news. I, I said earlier that we only pursue 30 to 40 percent of the inventions, right? Mm -hmm. So six, six uh, out of the ten uh, we cannot immediately pursue. What we've been doing, though, is instead of just turning those back, uh, an organization like BioStrategy Partners tells us what path we can follow to bring us to the point where we can't pursue it. That's great. So experts, whether it's regulatory, marketing, legal, um, are necessary. We, as much as we're building our, our capabilities in the office, uh, we're not experts in everything. So the, the most important thing is realizing where the holes are in expertise within the office and looking to an organization like BioStrategy Partners to pull in the right expertise. Critical. That's great. Um, Steve, we're actually starting to run a little bit short on time, but I wanted to give you an opportunity to discuss, if you would, for our viewers, how Temple's approach to um, technology commercialization and business development is unique. And sure. we've, got, we've got about a minute to... Okay. Uh, so first, uh, I see the front end of the office, and that's our interaction with faculty. And uh, we've created a, a mechanism where we can help build awareness and, and partner with them and be locally with them uh, to help move their innovations to market. So an embedded approach to tech transfer, not centralized in one office. Second, uh, moving the technology forward. We've developed a proof of concept funding program. We have an industry advisory network in, in which uh, that never meets, actually. It's a unique approach to engaging industry advisors without burdening them with committee meetings. Um, and, and that's a technology development fund that will interface with other funds within the region, which is an important point and will play a, a much larger role in some of the regional landscape and commercialization as well. And then I would say uh, deal making. Uh, we're often targeted for um, being a bottleneck uh, when it comes to actually doing business. And we do creative and rapid deal making. And that's a key differentiating factor. Well, yeah, because I mean that's an issue that I've often heard for you about universities generally, mm -hmm. you know, and and then there are a lot of uh, organizations that I look at look at some of the things that are being some of the innovations being developed at universities, and they see they never seem to give birth, you know, right. and so that kind of a that kind of a uh, you know a, a development, a unique approach is really is really very important. I would say we need to enable commercialization, not in, not stand in its way. That's right. Well, I think that's about all the time we have, and I could go for another probably two or three <laughs> shows. Yeah. I yeah. think to get to the end of the day, um, I want to thank our special guest this evening, Steve Navi. Steve, thank you very much. It was thanks really for having a great me. pleasure job. having you, Charlie. Thanks for co-hosting again. Always a pleasure. Thanks, Kimmon. Enjoy. Um, I want to remind our viewers that the, uh, the next guest on Money Matters is Doug Hepburn. He's a CPA of Hepburn Financial Advisors. Thanks for watching this evening, and we'll see you again next time.